literally is delighted that we've been able to organize this symposium and that I'm able to speak here today. Um, uh, it's very hard to add anything that Shaw, to, to what Shaw has just said about Patrick. I first met him at this celebrated conference in uh, Marseille in 1973, uh, and I remember I've worked, interacted and worked with Patrick for many decades after that. It is one of my lasting regrets that I missed the bus for this champagne reception. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm dedicating this talk to the memory of Patrick. It will highlight aspects of defect chemistry relating to electronic materials and to catalysis, and I hope the topics that would have, I'm pretty sure they are topics, uh, that would have interested Patrick. So the first area I'm going to look at concerns electronic structure and disorder in inorganic materials, particularly those uh, with important applications in energy technologies. And one point I should say is that this area that Patrick did so much to pioneer defects and disorder in solids is hugely and more than ever relevant today because of its importance and looks other things in materials for energy technologies. And I look at two related issues. These are the doping limits in wide band gap semiconductors, uh, where recent computational work I think has, has made quite useful progress, uh, and the related, very closely linked area of the equilibrium between electronic and point defects. And the second topic I will look at uh, is a different area of uh, solid state chemistry defects and doublets as active sites for catalytic processes. And uh, the whole area of catalysis, I don't think the role of defects uh, has been uh, sufficiently appreciated. So let's first just look at this topic of defects in wide band gap semiconductors. These are really important materials, particularly transparent conducting oxides. They combine optical transparency with electronic conductivity. And here are a whole list um, of applications, and here are some of the uh, types of material uh, that are, um, uh, are important. And we're going, to, we're, saying, we're going to look particularly at this material, zinc oxide. We'll also look at gallium nitride, which again is very widely used, for example, in solar cell applications, and where some of the issues I'm going to address are also raised. And we'll look thirdly at another material, which isn't a wide band gap system, but again is important for applications, uh, and that's silicon carbide. Well, let's just first look at some kind of basic considerations. Um, if we've got a material with a wide band gap and insulators such as sodium fluoride, calcium fluoride, and we dope it, which is the kind of experiment that Patrick would have done, uh, we dope it, we know what happens, that the compensation for the doping is provided by point defect. So if we dope sodium fluoride with magnesium, we get cation vapors. So, so there's no ambiguity there. These materials, like such as sodium fluoride, calcium fluoride, doping produces point defects as compensation. Now, if we look at a classic semiconductor, such as silicon or germanium, uh, i.e. narrow band gap systems, uh, again, there's no problem. If we dump them, we get electrons or holes as compensators. So we all know kind of elementary condensed matter physics that if we dump silicon with phosphorus, we get electrons, we get an end time. So, the big question is, what happens in the middle? If we've got a material like zinc oxide that's got an intermediate band gap, do we get ionic disorder or do we get electronic? Now, the answer to that question is that in fact there's an equilibrium uh, between the two, which is going to depend, amongst other factors, on uh, the magnitude of the band gap and on the energy formation of the uh, point defects. So what we're going to do now is show how by calculating the defect energies, by calculating them accurately, we can get a handle on this equilibrium between point defect and electron compensation. I was saying we'll look at these three materials, zinc oxide, gallium nitride, silicon carbide, all important for applications. Uh, here just details about, about their crystal structure. In fact, they all have the blurt side structure. Uh, so it's a relatively simple structure, so they're um, amenable to high quality calculations. And in fact, we'll use two approaches. Uh, the first is a kind of classic one in uh, solid state physics and chemistry, um, an embedded cluster approach, quantum mechanical, molecular mechanical approach, and I think the technique that Patrick was interested in in his career, um, where we need intratomic potential models, as I'll explain in a minute. 
Uh, and then we'll use for the silicon carbide a supercell approach, another very standard approach for modeling defects in solids. A uh, supercell with a periodic array of, um, of defects. Just a word about the um, embedded cluster methods. It's a very old concept that goes back back to Charles Coulson, was very widely used. And it's had, I think, a new lease of life in the last 10 years in a lot of the technical issues associated with doing these calculations accurately have been sorted out. So the basic idea is simple. We take a defect, it may be a trapped electron, and the surrounding lattice, and we treat that uh, explicitly quantum mechanically at a, a high quantum mechanical level. Um, so that's the business part of the system, and then we embed that in a region that's described much more approximately by intratomic potentials. And then we, in certain calculations on ionic systems, we have interface region uh, employing pseudo potentials so we can keep the electrons in the quantum mechanical cluster. And so a lot of work on the technical aspects of this approach over many years, I think has ensured that it really now, where you can get accurate intratomic potentials and you can use a good size of quantum mechanical that you can get highly accurate values uh, for uh, calculated uh, defects. Uh, this is a supercell approach. I don't want to go into uh, uh, any of the details here. We just set up a supercell periodically repeating a array of defects. The calculations I'm going to describe use the CP2K software, uh, which is a very good uh, and effective piece of software that also runs uh, very, very efficiently on the current generation of high performance computing. Now, as I said earlier, what we're going to try and understand uh, and predict is this equilibrium between electronic and <coughs> ionic defects. So, um, if we take, let's say, zinc oxide and we do accept a doping that we might be expected to give whole compensation, we've got to bear in mind that we can have this equilibrium. We can have an equilibrium between a system containing holes and one containing oxygen vacancies. Essentially, it's a redox reaction. Now, this simple bit of kind of solid state chemical thermodynamics has not been terribly well appreciated. And what we need to do is get a handle on the energy of that process. And similarly, if you dumb the dump material, so you create, you want to create electrons as compensators, again, we can have this redox release equilibrium in which the electrons are replaced, essentially, by oxygen interstitials. And whether you get electrons or holes or vacancies and interstitials is going to depend on the energetics of these reactions. And what I would argue now is we can calculate these uh, really rather accurately. So let's first just look at the stability of the electrons. And we're looking at these three materials here. So we're looking at <coughs> we're looking at this kind of energy I say where you have an electron being replaced uh, compensated for a a donor dumper by an oxygen interstitial. And you can calculate the energies of these, I think, at a pretty good level, uh, a high level of accuracy. And what you see is the energies are all positive. So what that tells you, if you introduce a donor dumpant into these materials, you're going to get electron compensation, because it costs you really quite a lot of energy, these are electron volts, to go over to the point defect compensation. And that's exactly what you see experimentally. We all know these materials are very easy to dump and dump. Now let's look, so electrons are selling in all three materials. Let's look at what we have with the holes. So if you try and accept a dump, zinc oxide, introduce holes, which there's a huge literature trying to do this, it's about trying to do this, then you see you've got a problem because in fact it's energetically favorable, thermodynamically favorable, for those holes to, for this redox reaction, which involves the whole compensation being replaced by, replaced by oxygen vacancies. Now this in fact helps us, and the same actually, for gallium nitride, but not for silicon carbon. And this actually helps us understand a, a long-standing experimental issue. I said there's a huge literature on attempts to P-dump, whole dump, accept a dump, that zinc oxide, and on oh, it doesn't work. And it's because of this very intrinsic thermodynamic aspect of the material. You're just fighting against thermodynamics. Same with gallium nitride. Again, we'll have huge literature on trying to beat down gallium nitride. It's very difficult. Now, it's not to say it's impossible. You may be able to stabilize these holes. They may be able to get them in there, net stable, stabilize them by dopants. But this really does explain 
why it's been so difficult uh, to do this. And it's, I think Patrick will like this, it's basic defect thermodynamics. So holes are unstable in zinc oxide and gallium nitride, and it's all tied in with some kind of basic electronic structure of the material. Uh, this, this summarizes the <coughs> electronic structure of the three materials put together by a combination of calculations and experiment. And what we essentially just see is that in zinc oxide, the level of the valence band is just too deep. It costs you too much energy to create holes. And so the system, if you try and create holes, makes vacancies instead. OK, so the conclusions of this work is the first that we can do, I think, with these um, hybrid calculations, these embedded cluster calculations, we can you do a good job on calculating these defect formation engineers. Patrick made a big contribution to <coughs> this area of theory, calculations of Lindbeck energies, uh, 40 years ago. Uh, we can use these to determine the balance between ionic and electron disorder. We see electrons are stable in all three materials, but holes are unstable in zinc oxide, gallium nitride. But in common, they are stable in silicon carbide. That helps us understand uh, a, a very big uh, literature on these systems. For those who are interested, here are some of the literature, very recent paper published in chemistry of materials. So that really was the first part of the talk, um, and just really showing how defect calculations, an area that Patrick was interested in, um, really can help us understand some very important aspects of these materials. Right, the second part concerns defects and dopants in catalysis, so it's a very different area of chemistry. Uh, but one where you say defects do play an absolutely crucial role, and we're going to look at three types of catalytic system, three most important types of catalytic system, and see the key role of defects in all of them. So let's take one of the first absolutely classic areas of catalysis, and that is methanol synthesis. Uh, methanol, this is the way you synthesize methanol. Uh, it's a very big industrial process that has been so for well over 100 years. You take syngas, sorry there's an inaccuracy on this slide. Syngas uh, is a mixture of hydrogen, carbon monoxide, I should have that in there, and there's crucially some carbon dioxide in the system. And <clears throat> you react this mixture, syngas, over this catalyst which is zinc oxide, promoted with copper, and the product is methyl. So I'm saying methanol, absolutely key building block in the chemicals industry, and this is a catalyst which does it. It's been around now for uh, 50 years, this catalyst, it replaced an earlier one, and it's, it's a very good catalytic system. Uh, a lot of work on it in the 80s, and then a lot of work again over the last 10 years. Now, understanding methanol synthesis, there are a number of challenges. The first, actually, is understanding the mechanism of surface hydrogenation of the zinc oxide. Because I say it's a, re sorry, it's a reaction between hydrogen, CO, CO2. So in fact the first step really of the catalysis is to dissociate the hydrogen from the surface of the material. So say so hydrogenation of the surface is of key importance. The second is once you've done that, you know, how does the hydrogen react with the carbon monoxide CO2 to make methanol, and in fact we know this catalysis does take place on the surface of zinc oxide, it's promoted by copper, but we want to understand the mechanism on the surface of zinc oxide. And then the third problem, and I'm not going to address today, is the role of the, of the copper in promoting the catalysis. Now, we need to think about the surface structure of zinc oxide, remember we said earlier, zinc oxide has the Burtside structure, and there's, we know from experiment that the catalytically active site the surface is the well, these polar surfaces, the oxygen and possibly the zinc terminated polar surfaces of, uh, of, of ZNO. Now, polar surfaces are very interesting. Uh, we know since really important work by Phil Tasker 30 years ago that you know basic electrostatic factors mean that polar surfaces, these are surfaces with dipole moments perpendicular to the repeat unit, um, are intrinsically unstable and we must do something to quench this dipole. We must reconstruct 
or we might be able to create a kind of electronically or by absorbing species. But um, the reconstruction for a material like zinc oxide is the most likely mechanism. And a number of years ago now, about 10 years ago, a colleague Alexei Sokol and others, Sam French, proposed a reconstruction in which essentially we remove some of the surface oxygen. So um, here's a surface oxygen site where if we remove, I think, about 20% of those, um, that reconstruction can quench the surface dipole. And this makes a site which is a beautiful trap for electrons. And, uh, oops, sorry, I should have, no, sorry, I thought I had a slide showing me electron trapped at that position. Uh, but you can see here, this is a nice site, it had an oxygen atom, and we can trap it. It turns out to be a very effective trap for electrons. So, um, I'd say a, 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 a nice defect. It's not quite a kind of service S center, but it's similar to a service S center. So, we argue, uh, and I think there's quite a lot of evidence for this, that this site, this defect site with an electron trapped here, plays a crucial role in the catalysis. Now, over 10 years ago, uh, Sam French, Alexei Sokol, and others pieced together a cycle for this catalytic process. Uh, I'm going to go look at some of the details in a few minutes, but I just want now to take, just take you through the, the overall aspects of this catalytic cycle. So, first we dissociate hydrogen. I'll come back to that in a minute. We then absorb CO2 at this site where we trapped an electron, and that's the absolutely crucial part of the catalysis, because the electron then is captured by the CO2 molecule and activates it. CO2, of course, is a very inert molecule, but if you transfer this electron to the CO2, you make it into a CO2 minus, it kind of bends then, it's no longer linear, and is activated. So that, that defect electron trapped at the side of the surface is absolutely crucial in the whole catalytic process because it activates the CO2. Once you've done that, it's actually quite straightforward for the catalysis to go, go ahead because CO2 minus is a really active species and it starts picking up the hydrogen atoms that you've dissociated. So you just go on adding hydrogen atoms and then round here, methanol, when you've added four hydrogen atoms, methanol leaves the surface but leaves an oxygen atom behind. So one of the oxygens originally in the CO2 is left behind here and then that oxidizes CO to CO2. Now this cycle, which I think now increasingly is accepted, was widely misunderstood when it was first published because people thought we were talking about conversion of H2CO2 into methanol, but not actually. We're talking about a cycle that converts syngas, which is predominantly H2 and CO, into methanol. The CO2 is purely catalytic. It is regenerated at the end of the cycle. Now, but the crucial role of CO2 is that it can be activated by this electron, by this defect site. Anyway, that's quite old work. Let's look at the more recent work. It's looked in, we've looked in great detail at the whole cycle. Uh, which essentially is, is what was published in over 10 years ago. But here is some of the updates where we're able to study some of these key steps uh, in much more detail. And in particular, we look at hydrogen dissociation, carbon dioxide activation, because these are very important processes, uh, not just in this kind of catalysis, but in lots of other areas of catalysis. So let's look at H2 dissociation. So this is work of Alexei Sokol, I should stress. And he unraveled this really well, quite unique mechanism for the dissociation. So we start off with the main of two apparent from the graphics. We have this site with the electron trapped at the this surface kind of pseudo vacancy. And that <coughs> the first thing that happens as the H2 molecule approaches the surface is that it captures that electron to make an H2 minus. That is actually a well, well characterized species. The H2 minus then dissociates into a hydride ion that sticks to one of the zinc ion, zinc ions on the surface, and there's a hydrogen atom which then loses its electron back to the surface, and the proton 
goes and sticks to the oxygen. So this effects heterolytic dissociation um, of the hydrogen into H minus and H plus. Hydride sticks to a zinc, proton sticks to an oxygen, and the electron, which is again it is that kind of catalyzing the whole process, is regenerated at the end. Now we were able, or say Alexei, who did this work, was able to make a contact experiment. There's a lot of very nice experimental data, particularly by Mike Banker, who's there at ICI, he's now at Cardiff University. I'm sorry, his data has been, seems to be here, been rotated through 90 degrees. Uh, anyway, very, very good TPD data. And in particular, we can compare the desorption energy, uh, which he has purposely obtained experimentally, uh, which is here with the calculation. There really is very good agreement. So that really does suggest that these calculations, these are all the embedded cluster methods, do a good job here. Now let's look at CO2 absorption, which I really rather like. Um, here is this yellow here, that is a graphical representation of the spin density. So this is the electron that's here trapped at this surface site. CO2 molecule comes down, and what you can nicely see is the electron goes on to the CO2 molecule, <coughs> and it's got, we've got CO2 minus, and that is now this active species. It's no longer inert, it's an active species, so it can start to pick up uh, the hydrogen atom. So that, this, I think, is quite an important general mechanism in CO2 chemistry as to how we can activate. If we've got these electron donor sites on surfaces, we can activate. CO2, which is a rather good thing to be able to do. Now again, we can compare with Banker's data rotated to 90 degrees uh, for CO2. Um, once again, a really nice agreement between uh, calculations and experiment. So that was the first example from uh, catalysis. Um, it's showing that this, this really rather intriguing species, electron trapped at the surface, uh, acts as it's a defect, and it really, we think this is how the catalysis crucial in this area of catalysis. Now, I think trapped electrons on oxide surfaces are probably important in one of other areas of catalysis. Now let's go to another field of catalytic science, very topical one, uh, that's oxidation of hydrocarbons. Now, oxidation of hydrocarbons, controlled oxidation of hydrocarbons is one of the real grand challenges in catalytic science. Now we all know it's easy to oxidize hydrocarbons as CO2 of water, but we want to oxidize them uh, in many contexts to more useful products such as alcohols and ketones and acids. And um, if you look at what is often done in industry for this, it's pretty brute force chemistry using oxidants like nitric acid, so uh, which are not exactly environmentally wonderful um, and energy intensive as well. The uh, this work is about trying to find much more benign oxidation methods. It follows a very elegant experimental work by, amongst others, John Murray Thomas, who I'm going to come on to later, Gopinath and Sanka, and Brian Johnson. And what they were able to show, they and others, is that this kind of catalyst, manganese, dumped into a framework structured aluminum phosphate, could do this catalysis. And they could do it with molecular oxygen, so not nitric acid or something unpleasant like that. Molecular oxygen uh, will oxidize alkanes to alcohols, ketones, and acids, which is what you want. Uh, when you don't, in these transition metals, manganese, cobalt, iron, into one of these microporous materials. This is a microporous aluminophosphate, so it's a framework structure material. It's built up out of ALO4. For tetrahedron, uh, and you're replacing some of the iron, aluminium uh, cations by these species, manganese and iron. So, so, very nice work by Thomas and others showing that this really does work, um, and, uh, but really the mechanism not known at all. So, about three years ago, uh, Luis Gomez, working in our group from Korea Cora, who works here at uh, UCL Chemistry, I decided to try and understand, using uh, computational methods, how this catalysis works. And these now are shifting technique. We're now doing periodic boundary conditions calculations. 
and density functional theory and using the very well established uh, crystal. Um, so this is the first step, this is in fact I think the most interesting part of the whole lot. Um, we're going to take a very simple alkane, um, ethane, but the same mechanism will apply. And how do you activate uh, ethane? Well again, you do it by this defect. You have a manganese replacing an aluminium. So it's a manganese 3 plus ion. It's good experimental data supporting that. Then you introduce your alkane. And this reaction takes place. The um, hydrogen on the ethane is transferred to the oxygen. But essentially, the electron on the hydrogen uh, reduces the manganese 3 to manganese 2 creating this actually very widespread defect in the chemistry of these microporous materials. Essentially, it's a protonated oxygen enabling a low valent uh, cation. There's actually Bronsted acid site. So uh, it's that process, it's that redox process at this defect site that initiates the whole reaction because it helps you pull this hydrogen off the ethane and it makes uh, essentially an ethyl radical but loosely bonded to uh, this hydroxyl species. It's not a high activation energy, but that agrees with what the experimental data that's available, long induction period, and you know, there was not much is known about the mechanism, but there's good evidence that it is a radical reaction. So this actually, I think, is the most interesting part of this, it's just how the whole lot gets going, and it gets going because of this defect species here. <laughs> And here's the second stage um, uh, in which the next thing, once we've made this ethyl radical, we remember we're oxidizing, it's an oxidation catalysis, so it then uh, picks up an oxygen molecule to form this superoxide radical, which then combines to manganese, and that helps essentially reoxidize the manganese from 2 to manganese 3, which we need to do in the catalytic cycle. We made this species here. I'll go on to the next slide. I'll show you this because I'm going to test Professor Corish later. Um, because what this is, it's just it, 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 it showing you two things. If you look at it carefully, you can see various other products you want, such as, in this case, ethanol and alcohol coming off. But this was a real tour de force by Luis Gomez, who used these calculations piece together a very detailed catalytic cycle that in fact gives the product that was observed um, experimental. And this work was primarily more or less completed in publication came out earlier this year. And it really, I think it does show, amongst other things, um, how these techniques in computational chemistry now really can help you understand complex catalytic processes. But uh, I mean, the point I'm trying to make above all is that the heart of this catalytic process, which these calculations, I think, have largely unraveled, at the heart there is this defect species. That's what gets the whole uh, lot going. Now, the final uh, example I'm going to give you, this is work of uh, Aaron Walsh about two or three years ago, and Aaron spent a, now at the University of Bath, spent a very productive period uh, working in a team here at UCL. And again, I think this is a topic that Patrick Right. It's about the origin of photochromism in a really fascinating type of material and it's very topical in contemporary uh, solid state chemistry. These are uh, inorganic organic hybrid uh, materials. And this is a beautiful example of a hybrid material. So, what you've got is you've got an inorganic component, so you've got these TiO2, these titanium oxygen, sorry, TiO6 octahedra that are linked together, like in these nice rings, but then you link these octahedra to other octahedra by these organic groups here, essentially these benzyl linkers. There are, it's a huge industry in contemporary solid state chemistry is making these kind of compounds. Uh, there are thousands of them that have been reported in the literature in recent years. This is actually been one of the nicest studies. They're all based on this idea, taking an inorganic component and linking them together using an organic component. So they're very flexible systems. You can, you can play an infinite number of games in the chemistry of these systems. Anyway, um, we were interested in this material here, first reported in this very nice paper uh, 
behind this French group. And one of the reasons, well, actually, the main reason why we're interested in it is because it does show a very intriguing property of photochromism. So if you irradiate this material in the UV, in the near UV, um, mm -hmm. it, it goes black. And uh, we were interested in understanding <coughs> the basic chemistry behind that. Uh, and the density functional theory calculations, very standard DFT here. Just a, a <coughs> summary of here, you've got the, the calculate the, um, the electronic structure of the material, calculate the uh, lattice parameters. In fact, the lattice parameters are a bit large, that's because these calculations didn't take into account dispersion, which DFT doesn't do, or that flavour of DFT wouldn't do. So we could do them again now with DFT plus D, but I don't think it would alter the, the basic um, aspect of the calculation. <coughs> and that was this. Mm -hmm. Calculation of the energetics of this process. So we looked at the energy to pull an oxygen atom out, <coughs> make an oxygen molecule, so it's another of these defect red X reactions, and reduce to 10 to 4, 2 to 10 to 3. Calculate the energy of that, it's 2.7 to B. In fact, it's slightly less than the band gap. So if you irradiate in the band with band gap light, which is what you do when you're making photochromic, then you're going to drive. You've got enough energy to drive this reaction. So that is what we say is going on uh, in the photochromic activation. Remember, it's TI3 plus species, and that, will, that species will be responsible for the, uh, for the dark colour. So <coughs> this colour change under irradiation, again, is another defect reaction. So irradiate bang out line, and that is sufficient to drive this reaction, which involves the reduction of titanium-4 to titanium-3 and the loss of oxygen. Okay, well, before I finish, first let me thank the people who have done this work. I tried to acknowledge them as we went along. Furio, Cora and Lewis uh, <coughs> were uh, essentially led the work on the oxidation catalysis and very strong interaction with the open up and Sanka on the experimental side of that work. Uh, Dennis Campbell and Alexis Sokol, uh, Scott Woodley and Aaron Walsh involved in the other parts of the work. And they are the people who funded this work. But the main thing, sorry, I wanted to do was a special thanks to Patrick. Now, as I said, we heard one of the characters from Sean of Patrick's contributions. And I'm just going to pick out three, um, three, I think, key aspects. The first is unambiguous scholarship. I mean, I think Sean said that. Patrick really wanted to get things right. And if he wasn't sure he had he got them, that they were right, he went and did them again. So this, this was all of the aspects of his work. And it's a very, very important um, attribute for a scientist and for any scholar. <clears throat> so scholarship, and that, that struck me right from the beginning of my association with Patrick Rigo. Again, absolutely. Any paper of Patrick's, either copy, experimental or computation, you can believe what's reported there. You can believe the numbers. If he quotes an, quoted an experimental defect formation energy, you knew that was right within the experimental errors that he would have specified and his calculations. So he made a big contribution to calculations uh, that, uh, again, you, you knew that those be properly undertaken, confident in the results. Then, of course, humanity. Um, <coughs> so I met Patrick when I first went as a PhD student at this celebrated conference in uh, Marseille, but I then interacted scientifically with Patrick for many, many decades. And in fact, Patrick is a co author, Patrick and I are co authors on some of the papers I'm proudest of in my career. But it was, particularly in my younger days, great inspiration uh, to work with Patrick. And uh, it was really important to encourage people early, early in the career, sometimes later as well. But I mean, he really did that. So many thanks, Patrick, for all you've done for science, and in fact, for all you've done for me. So thanks very much. Thank you.
Yeah, you could probably do them for other structures as well, which would be a good thing to do. My, my, I, I suspect that it would not make too much difference. But it would be interesting, which you could do, to a to good point, to do those calculations for some of the other problems. Without titanium mortgage, you very blind. Yeah. Have you done any saves on it? I mean, how much? No, again, that's a good suggestion. Because not, no, that's what we find is you, know, you don't need many sites to go to church in to, no. to get the colour. No. No, that, that, that's a very good suggestion. It would be, it would be good to do that. Okay, thank okay. you, Richard.